Good morning, everyone. Thanks to Dr. Chang for inviting me to present. So I will be talking about a case today um, on a patient with abdominal pain and constipation with, in a patient with fibromyalgia. So this is a patient Dr. Chang and I saw in clinic, and she is a 27-year-old female. She's coming in with constipation and abdominal pain. She describes having daily abdominal pain in bilateral lower quadrants, and when you get more history from her, she talks about having a childhood tendency towards constipation, um, but her constipation really worsened one year ago when she had knee surgery. And since then, she said her bowel habits have never really returned to what she describes as normal. Um, prior to surgery, she was a very active person. She ran 30 to 60 minutes a day. And then currently her symptoms have really led her to miss work, limits her social life. So definitely some impairment in her um, overall function. So I think the first thing I always do when someone comes in to me talking about constipation is to make sure that what the patient describes as constipation is consistent with what we as gastroenterologists think of as constipation. So Dr. Chang always encourages us to actually go over the Bristol stool form scale. So our patient said that she was having type one to type two stool more than 50% of the time. And then she never had type six or seven stool. Um, and she was only having bowel movements every four to five days. Um, her pain would improve after having a bowel movement, but she, it's still present at all times. And then she also reports incomplete evacuation, bloating and distension. Her medical history was notable for having chronic migraines, and it was worse in the past year alongside her worsening constipation and abdominal pain. She has a recent diagnosis of fibromyalgia. She was diagnosed with hypersomnia and non-restorative sleep by a sleep specialist. She has a history of depression that's well controlled on an SSRI that's been um, prescribed for many years by her psychiatrist. And then during the visit, she also disclosed a history of childhood abuse um, and reports that she was seeing a psychotherapist for that. She is taking uh, Miralax for her constipation, which she says doesn't really help her symptoms. She's on pregabalin for her fibromyalgia and then sertraline for her depression. She has no allergies and her only pertinent surgical history was that history of her knee surgery. Um, she has a, um, she has no drugs, tobacco, or alcohol use. And then her family history is interesting. So she reports that her mother had a history of chronic abdominal pain that was never diagnosed formally. Her sister has a history of depression and then no history of GI cancers, IBD, or celiac. So I wanted to keep a broad differential diagnosis with this patient. So as gastroenterologists, we always wanna make sure we're not missing colorectal cancer. Um, if there's a prior history of um, bowel surgery, you wanna think about strictures or extrinsic compression from another intra-abdominal structure. You wanna think about endocrinologic causes of constipation. So hypothyroid is very common, but also thinking about hyperparathyroidism, diabetes, neuropathic injury. Um, medications are another important factor to consider with constipation. Um, in her particular case, um, sertraline and Lyrica are pretty uncommon causes of constipation. And then the timing of her symptoms and when she started these medications didn't really quite fit as the primary etiology of her symptoms. You also wanna think of pelvic floor dysfunction, celiac disease, endometriosis. So she came in with quite a bit of prior diagnostic workups. So she had a normal upper endoscopy and colonoscopy. And then her laboratory workup was also unremarkable. Um, but for physical exam, I think rectal exam is a really important component of evaluating someone with constipation and to check for pelvic floor dysfunction. So her rectal exam was abnormal. She had increased rectal tone and then she had decreased perineal descent, but appropriate sphincter relaxation. So a questionable rectal exam really wanted me to um, investigate further. So we recommended that she get an anal rectal manometry. And in the interest of time, I won't go over this um, in detail, but the main abnormal finding was she did have some um, increased resting anal pressure 
Um, and then I think a quick way to look at an anal rectal manometry is to look at the balloon expulsion test because I think it's a really good functional test and simulates what it's actually like for the patient. Um, and hers was normal. So negative for dyssynergic defecation. So based on her clinical presentation, I felt that she met criteria for IBSC. And just to refresh your memory on the Rome 4 criteria, um, sh she had recurrent abdominal pain on average at least one day a week in the past three months and was associated with defecation, a change in stool frequency, and a change in stool form. And then specifically for IBSC, um, she also met that criteria because on the days that she was having abnormal bowel habits, her stool form met was more than 25% Bristol stool one or two. So some risk factors for IBS in our patient. Um, she had a history of early childhood adversity and trauma. She had a family history of DGBI. So her, with her mother with that chronic abdominal pain was very suspicious for an underlying DGBI. Um, she has a history of depression. And then she had several associated medical conditions that we think of in IBS and other DGBI. So migraines, fibromyalgia, and sleep disturbances. So now I will turn it over to our audience to um, see what you guys think about what would you recommend for the initial management of this patient. So your options are fiber supplementation, dietary modification, increasing her Miralax dosing, starting lin linaclotide, or starting procalipride. Okay, let's show the results. Okay, a good percentage of people would opt to start linaclotide. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so we, um, in the interest of time, so our patient was started on lin linaclotide, so what many of our audience members um, also selected. And the reason we did this is we were trying to target both her abdominal pain as well as normalize her bowel habits. Um, so two months later, she comes back to clinic and she reports that the linaclotide was very successful in normalizing her bowel habits. Um, she's now having one daily bowel movement, Bristol stool form three to four. She's reporting a improvement in the sensation of incomplete evacuation, but she's still complaining of abdominal pain, bloating, and distension. Um, so then we can actually move to our next audience question. So how would you proceed with the next step in management of the patient? And no wrong answers here. So your options are starting a tricyclic antidepressant, starting duloxetine, behavioral therapy. And then she was started on the 145 microgram dose of linaclotide. So there was room to increase her linaclotide as well. Okay, let's show the results. So more variation here. Um, and I won't tell you what happens next. Instead, I'll turn it over to Dr. Chang, who will talk to you more about the management of IBSC. Thank you.